Hi, uh, I'm Laura from Hope Living, and today, in conjunction with Aston Martin Residences, we have the distinct pleasure of tasting Champagne Bollinger with Cyril De La Rue, a sixth generation family member of the Bollinger family. Bollinger, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is an icon in Champagne. It's known around the world for powerful, polished champagnes that are among the greatest non-vintages and vintages produced. It also happens to have a longtime on-screen relationship with British secret agent James Bond, having been featured in every Bond movie going back to 1973's Live and Let Die. And the 25th Bond film, uh, No Time to Die, in fact, was meant to be released today, but um, has since been pushed to next year. Um, so before uh, we begin our tasting today, I am going to tell you a little bit about Cyril De La Rue, who, as I mentioned previously, is a sixth generation member of the Bollinger family. He's worked in the wine industry for the last 14 years um, as a flying winemaker in top wineries in America, South Africa, and New Zealand. And he moved back to France in 2007, working as a vineyard manager and winemaker in the Loire Valley at Langlois Chateau, which is also owned by the Bollinger family, before starting his own consultancy business, which specializes also in the wine industry. Um, in 2014, convinced of the potential of Champagne Ayala, on the US market, he joined the family business to be its US commercial director. He has since expanded his responsibilities and now also oversees the US business for Bollinger, Domaine Chanson, and Langlois Chateau. So um, without further ado, I am going to introduce you to Cyril. Hi, Cyril. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited. We are very excited to have you. And um, for everybody watching uh, today, if you could please refrain from asking questions until the end, Cyril is going to be answering as many questions as possible about his family's champagne house. So Cyril, um, I'm gonna ask a few questions right now about Bollinger before we start with the tasting. And maybe you could give us a little bit of background um, on the house. Yeah, so Champagne Boulanger uh, is a family house. It was started or founded in 1829. And uh, we even have uh, archives going up to the 15th century where the family was holding, you know, vineyards and, uh, and forest or land at that time. And really when they started in 1829 from the beginning, the focus was about Pinot Noir, about vineyards and about uh, an extreme focus to, to details and quality. Uh, so the question would be why Pinot Noir? Uh, if you are into wine, uh, you, you, you would have noticed that some of the best wine in the world are made of Pinot Noir. And that's because the Pinot Noir, when it's well done, it really gives uh, a beautiful complexity and a beautiful texture and a beautiful um, edging potential to, to the wines. And that's exactly what we are looking for at, uh, at Bollinger. And uh, then if you want to make good Pinot Noirs, you need to have good vineyards. So this is how we can you know, to, to have uh, holdings. Uh, so we own, uh, in, I know in, in uh, hectares, in hectares it's 180 hectares, so that's around 400 acres uh, of vineyards. It's all Premier and Grand Cru, so it's beautiful. And uh, it's most, most of it is, uh, is about Pinot Noir. And then we, of course, to, cook, to, to a blend, we also have a little bit of, um, of uh, Chardonnay. And uh, it's quite uh, extraordinary. I call it a, a beautiful luxury to have so much vineyards, uh, especially that uh, one of our criteria is that at least, you know, 60% uh, uh, of our total production must come from our own vineyards. And uh, if you look at overall in, uh, in Champagne, uh, uh, a house would own roughly 10% of land when for us it's 60%. So that's why really I call it luxury, especially for us when it's all uh, Premier and Grand Cru. So that give us full control on the entire process and what is most important on the grapes, which are you know the, the raw material. And if you don't have good grapes, you cannot make good wines. I've been winemaker as you as you introduced. And even if you are the best winemaker in the world, if you don't have the good uh, grapes, you cannot make good wine. So first you need to have beautiful grapes and then you can start playing with them and make great wines. And, uh, and lastly, I will, uh, I will finish uh, this introduction with, uh, with the quality, the focus to details, which is extremely important to, to Champagne Boulanger. And we are strong believers, you know, into every single uh, task. You have the choice to go uh, simple, average, or deep. And at Boulanger, we don't like facility, so we like to go deep into every single details. And at the end, this is why uh, the taste of the wine can be different 
you know, you will have uh, different tests with different uh, champagne profiles. And the explanation is coming from the, 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 the vineyard and the winemaking process where you go every detail if you go deep or not. And at Boulanger, we really are committed to go to, 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 to full details and, uh, mm -hmm. and that makes a, a complete difference at the end. My, uh, my aunt, uh, Lily Boulanger, she used to say, if it's good for the wine, we do it. And that's still the, the philosophy or the approach at Champagne Boulanger. There is no compromise uh, for, uh, for, uh, for quality. That's extremely important. So Pinot Noir, yeah. vineyards and quality, pretty simple. <laughs> and also it's very, very rare, but this is one of the last family owned vineyards in Champagne. Can you uh, speak to that a little bit about how that came to be that it's still family owned? So how that came to be, uh, I guess it's because of a strong will of the family to preserve the business uh, with the family. But yeah, uh, you're right. It's only three houses uh, in Champagne that are still owned by the same family uh, from, the, from the foundation until now. Uh, for us, it's going to be close to two, 200 years old. And myself, I'm the, I'm the sixth generation of the, of the Boulanger family. And uh, I, there is a percentage which uh, I like quite a lot. It's only 5% uh, of the businesses that go up to the third generation and less than 1% goes, goes uh, up to the, to, the, to the fifth generation. So currently we are the sixth generation. So we are writing something really extraordinary and, um, and we are extremely proud of this. So how, I guess it's because we are all conscious of, um, of the beauty of Boulanger. Uh, Boulanger being you know, an exceptional uh, brand uh, in terms of uh, positioning on the market, but also an exceptional, uh, and maybe more, most importantly, an exceptional uh, champagne uh, in terms of taste. When you taste champagne Boulanger, you know, it will really stand out if you, if you map all the champagne and the taste. Champagne Boulanger will stand out in terms of taste. It's very distinctive. And that's also the family is extremely proud and committed to this taste. Uh, we, we may go uh, later in the process of Champagne Boulanger and some, some, uh, some part of this process can seem to be complete nonsense if you look only on the economic aspect. But if you look for the, for the quality, for the taste of the wine, it makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. And that's why we, we are dedicated, the family, to, to this process, which for us really is going to, to magnify the taste of, uh, of Pinot Noir. Now, maybe you could explain a little bit about your role today and what you exactly do with the company. Yeah, so me, I came into the wine business uh, almost by mistake. I was, I was really into, uh, into horses. And uh, then um, I went into a school uh, doing um, agriculture and there was no horses in this school, unfortunately. So this is when I, I moved to, to wine. And uh, so my point is that I was not... Um, destinated to work within the family business. It really came after uh, a few years uh, since I was in the wine business, I was evolving you know, more in, in the production. And at one stage, my uncle, uh, which is currently the, the CEO of, uh, of, our, of our group, of our family group, uh, he asked me if I was interested and he has an opportunity to, to move to the US. So this is really when I joined the, the, the family business, uh, being the, the representative uh, for, for all our wineries. Uh, in the US, so there is uh, Champagne Boulanger, of course, but also uh, Champagne Ayala in Champagne, Domaine Chanson in Burgundy, Langlois Chateau in the Loire Valley, and Cognac uh, de la Main. And I was representing those uh, all five uh, wineries uh, there. So this is how I started with the family. And currently, it's been two years now, I'm back to France. So I'm in Aï, uh, the little, uh, very small village, in, uh, which is a Grand Cru in the heart of the Pinot Noir Kingdom of, uh, of Champagne. And this is where the, the, the Champagne Boulanger is located. And I'm in charge of uh, all the uh, commercial developments. So meaning internal and external projects and, uh, you know, uh, promoting the, the, what we're doing uh, on, the, on the every day uh, to, to the world. That's mm -hmm. a quite exciting job. It sounds like an exciting job. You live in a great place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk a little bit today, of course, about um, the houses relationship with James Bond. Yeah. And I understand that this came to be with a handshake and a gentleman's agreement. Is that the truth? It is actually the truth. And this is very uh, James Bond story. 
that uh, this story started with a, with a handshake, with a gentleman agreement, very gentleman done. Um, so, you know, in the books that Ian Fleming wrote, there is mentions of a, a few champagnes, uh, not only Bollinger, but uh, Bollinger, uh, I think is first mentioned in Diamonds, uh, what's the name again? Uh, I have my notes here. It's Diamonds uh, Forever. And um, that's the first time, the first appearance of, uh, of Champagne Boulanger in the Indian Fleming books. And uh, a few years after, the, the, the Ian Fleming is, uh, is approached by Albert Broccoli. And uh, he basically purchased the right to do movies. And uh, this is really when the success of James Bond is, is going to start. And uh, Albert Broccoli uh, realized that the books were not uh, internationally well known. And he decided to go and, and seek for the top brands which are mentioned in the books. So this is how he decides to go to, to Champagne Boulanger. You know, in the UK, Champagne Boulanger has a very strong position, both in terms of, um, of positioning and, uh, and notoriety with the queen. Uh, so this is almost naturally that he, he, he came to, to Champagne Boulanger. So he came to the winery and uh, he, he, he had a beautiful dinner with, uh, with my uncle, uh, Christian Bizot which is actually the, the father of the, of the current CEO of the company. And uh, at the end of, uh, of this dinner, of, I guess it went pretty well. Um, they decided to, to work to get together and that uh, Champagne Boulanger will be the, the official uh, champagne, uh, favorite champagne of, uh, of James Bond. So this is how it started with a, with a gentleman agreement, a handshake, uh, and that was in the 70s. And, you know, that was just before Moonraker, uh, 1979, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, now it's 40 years, 40, yeah, a little bit, 40, 41 years. Incredible. How is that? How has the partnership evolved in the last 40 years? But it evolved uh, pretty well. I mean, we, we've been following the trend of, uh, of James Bond, uh, it, which is, you know, becoming a beautiful, uh, a beautiful uh, business, if we can talk like that. The, what, what I found extraordinary with this, uh, with this movie is that you can watch it with multi-generations. It can be the grandfather watching it with his son, watching it with his grandson or, or granddaughter. Um, and, and that's what is extraordinary. It goes over the time. And this is also what we like, you know, with Champagne Boulanger is uh, time is one of our pillars. And uh, we, we, we like to go also over the, the time like that. So I think it works uh, pretty well for that. And um, more, more recently, we, we started to do, a, you know, a limited edition with a, with a movie release. Uh, so it's specific, spe specific bottling that we've dedicated to, uh, to James Bond. And uh, Boulanger, it's always about quality first. So it's a, it's a beautiful wine. And uh, we dedicated to, to, the, to the movie release, playing then when the, when the wine is made, is, is crafted, we can play with, uh, with packaging and, uh, and have some uh, beautiful, yeah, exactly. So have some beautiful, uh, have some fun with, with, with the packaging. Which I will show you right here. Maybe you could explain, um, I don't know if you want to explain this, the uh, sort of rules about France versus. Ah, Austria. yes. So this <laughs> This packaging, actually, we could not find it uh, in France, unfortunately. Uh, this is the packaging you find in uh, most, if not every country uh, where Boulanger is uh, represented. But in France, unfortunately, there is a law that prevents, you know, driving and drinking. And, uh, and we were not able to, to have this, uh, this packaging uh, in France. Yeah. But in all the, all, all the other markets, you can find it. And uh, we are extremely happy with the result of this uh, packaging. You know, it's not often you can have uh, some strong symbols on, uh, on the packaging, especially on the champagne packaging. And uh, for, for this one, you know, uh, we went to see um, the, the, the famous photographer, Greg Williams, and uh, he came out with this beautiful idea to combine uh, James Bond with the person of, of, uh, of Daniel Craig and, and the car, the DB5. Uh, all along in the on the on the packaging of on the box of uh, of Boulanger, so it's a perfect combination. And I think for the 40th anniversary of uh, of Bond, it's uh, it's kind of uh, of really fun to have this uh, this packaging. It's definitely a must for Bond fans, I would say, especially because this is meant to be as we were saying before, Daniel Craig's uh, last appearance is 007. So, um, great great presentation. Yeah. What are your favorite? Oh, so the Brits call it Bali. So what is your, what are some of your favorite Bali moments in Bond films? 
wow, there are a few. Um, I, I, I was listing uh, some of them before to tell you my, uh, my favorite. So there was one in uh, Live and Let Die, which is actually quite nice. And uh, it's Roger Moore at the time, and he ordered some uh, Boulanger. A little bit later in the movie, uh, is, um, no, it's in Moonraker, where there was a mention is, is, uh, is really saying, oh, Boulanger 69, uh, what a pleasure, or something like that. Um, and to me, my favorite, it's really in, uh, in Golden Eye. You know, this is with, um, with uh, Pierce Brosnan. He's in the car, he's, he's uh, with a beautiful girl, of course, like always, uh, with James Bond in the car. And um, he stopped the car and uh, he opened up a little box within the car and there was a beautiful bottle of Bollinger chilled, ready to be served and to be poured. So that's one of my favorites, yeah, for sure. Who's your favorite Bond? Which, ah. So, Sean Connery, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's my favorite. Uh, actor, even if I like a lot Daniel Craig, Daniel Craig has this, um, has something uh, which maybe Sean Connery did not get, which is 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 is, is, a, is a killer, and you can feel this uh, this part of him also, even if he's very gentleman. But Sean Connery, to me, it's also part of my of my uh, childhood, I guess, because I was not allowed to watch TV when I was a child, and uh, even even a teenager. And uh, my first, uh, my first uh, Bond uh, that I was allowed by my parents to watch, I'm talking a long, long time ago, was actually uh, from Russia with Love, uh, so Sean Connery. And since then, you know, it, it stayed as a, as a great memory, as, a, as one of my favorites. Yes, for sure. Amazing. Yeah. Well, lucky for me today, I get to taste this with you. So um, maybe you could walk um, me and everybody watching through your special QV 007. Yes. So special QV, it's uh, really our, uh, our flagship. Um, this is a flagship of, uh, of Champagne Boulanger, meaning it's, um, it's, it's a, 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 our larger production, but it's also um, a combination of all uh, our craftsmanship. You have uh, many elements of our DNA coming into this wine. It's going to be uh, mostly Pinot Noir, 60% Pinot Noir, 25 Chardonnay, and then a touch of uh, Pinot Meunier, 15%. And we are going to use only the, the best juices, only which we call the cuvee. And when we press harder, we're not going to use those, uh, those juices. So it's only the, the, the cleanest juice that goes into it. And then uh, another element which is quite interesting with the uh, special cuvee, we are going to use a lot of edge wines. Uh, you, I told you about the taste which we are uh, seeking uh, at Boulanger and, and the, the good expression of Pinot Noir. And with non-vintage Champagne, you expect the wine to be the same year after years. It's actually quite difficult because every vintage is going to be different. So how do, address, how do we address that? We address that in Champagne with blending other older vintages. Most of the houses are going to blend 20 to 30% of what we call reserve wine, which are aged wines, and they're going to be one or two years old. Uh, at Champagne Boulanger, and especially on Special QV, we are going to go up to, uh, to 50% of, uh, of reserve wine. And, um, and, we are go and some of those wines are going to be you know, quite old. Uh, and that's what makes, what helps to have the, 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 the consistency of taste on this wine. And we are also pushing even further the complexity of the process because some of um, the wines are going to be aged in magnums. So wine magnums, you know, magnum is the best format to age the wine. And we are going to keep those reserve wine for maybe, uh, uh, yeah, between five to 15 years old. So average is going to be 10 to 12 years old. And the magnum is the best format to age. So the wines are going to be better and better year after years. So all this combination, you know, makes a wine which is going to be ready about um, fruit. You will have some uh, beautiful fruits, uh, fresh citrus, and then it will evolve to uh, more. I don't know if you have a glass. I have a glass myself. So uh, <laughs> are you drinking by the bottle? I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so, so very fresh, but at the same time, you have a beautiful um, uh, density and complexity on the wine. What I call complexity is the evolution of the aromas. It will start, you know, with this uh, uh, citrus, lemon, evolve with um, white fruits, um, like uh, pear, you will have notes of peach, 
and then you will evolve more to the spiciness on the, on the wine. That's really what we call complexity. And that's to, re, to if you look at uh, other champagnes, which are going to be more linear, like uh, to be a little bit cliche, green apple or these kind of things. Boulanger is the opposite. And you're going really to have the, the evolution of the fruit. So that's for the nose. And then you're going to put it in your mouth. And what's really what stands out is the texture of the wine. And that's going to be the signature of, uh, of Champagne Boulanger that you will find on all the wines on different level. But the texture, we call it the creamy bubbles. And these creamy bubbles is going to map, to, to fill up your mouth. And that's coming to the, the intensive uh, volume of, uh, of uh, edge wines and also the barrel fermentation coming into it. The barrel is going to give this texture, which is lovely and which is really the signature of the house. And that what the bubbles are almost coming on a, on a second layer. They're not aggressive. They're coming first, it's like a wine, you're tasting a wine, and then the bubbles are, are even lifting up the experience of tasting, bringing new aromatics, etc. So that's really, uh, it seems very simple when we say it this way, but this is actually extremely difficult to achieve. And that's why I was saying in introduction that, you know, the, the taste of Champagne Boulanger really stands out. And that's thanks to all the, the craftsmanship of our team uh, to, to produce this wine. Incredible. It's like, it's so creamy. It is yeah. amazing. Yeah, the texture is very nice. Good with mm -hmm. food. Maybe you could share why you decided to do the use a special cuvee for the 007. But since it's a, since it's the flagship of uh, of Champagne Boulanger, you know it was making sense uh, that um, the, this wine was uh, was part of the of the adventure of uh, of of, uh, of Bond. But before that, we we also did uh, another uh, limited edition uh, on a vintage. So we did two. We did one with a 2000 uh, vintage uh, coming on a specific box, and then this one uh, on, uh, for, for Special Cuvée. And uh, we, we decided to do it because uh, Special Cuvée being the flagship on the 40th anniversary, we, it, it was making perfect sense you know, to have this, uh, this wine part of the, of, the, of the story of the adventure. This is the first time we are using um, a Special Cuvée with Bond. Uh, and uh, and that's why we, we decided to go with uh, with Greg William and, and with with this specific uh, packaging. Now, where can we find this in the states? Uh, in the states, we can find it in most uh, most retails. Uh, or, or, yeah, I'm not exactly sure uh, which retailer, but uh, in wine.com should I have it. Uh, you know, you can. I don't know if I if I can give names, but uh, the key retailers in the key cities will definitely have has it. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's it should not be difficult to find online. No worries, it's available. Wonderful. <laughs> now um, we are also tasting two other champagnes today. However, um, Cyril is on uh, lockdown in France. So um, unfortunately he's not able to get a few of the bottles, but he is still going to describe them and talk about them for us today. So we have the Rosé Envy, um, which has quite an interesting backstory. Maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, this is a little baby in the range, so not as young uh, as uh, as the new edition uh, that we talk after. But it's still a new a new wine. If we look at the the entire story of Champagne Boulanger of 200 years old, this wine was uh, was released in 2008, and the reason why Boulanger did not get a, a rosé uh, prior to that was uh, because of Madame Boulanger. For her, you know. Um, Rosé has not the proper image for Champagne Boulanger. If we go back, you know, to the early 20th century, uh, Rosé wines were at that time poured in brothels. And, uh, and for her, that was absolutely inappropriate to have Champagne Boulanger uh, doing a Rosé for this specific reason. So in, uh, in 1976, uh, and Madame Boulanger was still uh, running uh, Champagne Boulanger, we decided to, to release a vintage Rosé because that was really at the top quality that uh, that could be uh, could be uh, could be done uh, by Champagne Boulanger, and um, it's only in 2008 that uh, we 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 decided to go on the, on the rosé non vintage, uh, and that uh, Madame Boulanger she passed away in 77, but we were still you know with this uh, idea of uh, uh, should we do the rosé yes or no, 
and then the trend also the the consumer demand were really uh, uh, begging for uh, for a rosé and that was a success from the beginning so that's why in 2008 uh, we decided to release it but you know having the rosé released in 2008 it means you have to think about it prior to that because it's three three years on the lease and then you have to make all the the, the, the concept etc so it's really uh, more in the two, around 2000 that we started to to really think to really think of doing a, a, a rosé and as I said, it was really uh, quite successful from the beginning. Still small, and we, we want to, to keep it, you know, not, uh, not uh, as, as too much of a production because we want to stay very focused to, to the quality of, uh, of the wine. Uh, but uh, great success, yeah. And she would have been proud of this. Of uh, course. Yes, of course. Otherwise, <laughs> we would not have done it. Absolutely, yes. And she can be really proud of it because we kept the same approach as a, as a vintage rosé, La Grande Année Rosé. That um, uh, and she, again, she was part of the release of this uh, vintage rosé, La Grande Année Rosé, in '76. So we kept the idea, the same, uh, the same uh, process, same thought process of it, which is having uh, first the Boulanger style. And when you taste this rosé, you really get uh, that it's uh, this vinosity, this sophistication, but on the same time, extremely elegant and a lot of subtlety in the wine. And that's really the, the, the signature of uh, the style of Champagne Boulanger. But on the same time, you, you, you get this uh, freshness coming from, uh, from uh, the red wine that we're going to add onto it. And as for La Grande Année Rosé, we decided to run specific plots for red wine that we would blend into the rosé. So um, we back to the, 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 the beauty of having your own vineyards because you can really play on different parameters that some other people are not allowed to do. And we were able to, to run, to, to manage specific plots that were really good for red wine on the way we wanted to get more concentration. And like this, we're able to add just a tiny, tiny bite of, uh, of red wine 5%, which is usually, usually, you know, the house, they can go up to 15, 20, 30% of red wine and just 5% for us, it's enough. And that's going to bring this freshness that like the fresh berries um, that you get on the nose on the, on the, on the rosé. So taste profile, what else um, would we expect to be tasting? On the nose? So on the nose, you know, you, you get really this, uh, these berries to me, this is really what, uh, what stands out. And then you will go on the, um, on the mouth. And as I told you about the signature, you will find this texture again, but always with a beautiful uh, elegance. It's not, um, it's almost refreshing um, that you could, you know, sometimes uh, you, when you have some, when you say rich, it can be a little bit seen as heavy, but here, this is not at all what, is, what it is. You have a beautiful um, elegance and again, freshness coming from this uh, addition of, uh, of red wine and from the balance uh, on the wine. So it's, it can be really enjoyed uh, all over the year, uh, not just for summer, if, uh, even if it's perfect close to the pool, um, but you can really enjoy it uh, you know, in winter also. And, and you can even play with some food, uh, some great food pairing with this, uh, with this rosé. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of course, uh, uh, some uh, tuna, like a raw tuna, uh, which is always amazing, but also some duck, uh, this kind of thing. You, you can have fun uh, with, because of the vinosity and the texture with the high acidity that goes extremely well with food. Now that's so interesting that you say that you can drink this at any time of year because people, I think, do associate rosé with summer. So um, how do you kind of combat that, um, that expectation that that's the only time of year that you can drink this? Uh, you mean why people think they are they can drink uh, rosé in summer? Why they think that it's only for summer? So how how do you go about trying to correct them? Well, the best is to taste uh, is to taste our rosé uh, at at another time of the year, which we love to do. For instance, tonight, you know, we're in November and we are tasting rosé uh, Boulanger, and it's actually drinking perfectly well. And you will you will be extremely happy to have it with food also. So yeah, and the wine is um, it's um, it goes again it goes good it goes well with food and all our process especially we're working a lot on the texture of the wine and and the finish you have this salinity uh, on the finish of our wines that goes very well with uh, with food because the wine is not heavy it stays it's extremely elegant 
and um, and that's why uh, we we believe it, it goes well with uh, with food all year long, and not just fresh uh, fresh light uh, light salad, uh, for instance, that you can find in summer. It can go with uh, with many other things, and even desserts. You know, uh, you can go with some. Um, some uh, like red berries, uh, dessert, these kind of things. Uh, yeah. Very the best fun. is to try it out of, uh, out of the summer. Get some in your cellar and just try it <laughs> every month and you will see which month you prefer it. I can attest it's wonderful in November. <laughs> You have it here. <laughs> so um, we have one more champagne to try, which is um, something I'm very excited about, uh, the PNVZ 15. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this very exciting new release. Yeah, so this is our little baby um, that was released just this year. So it's brand new. And you know, um, Boulanger, we, we don't do novelties uh, very often. So the last one was 2008 with the Rosé. So now we have this one. So it's, um, it's a strong moment for the, um, for the, for the, for, for the house. Um, the idea of this wine was about Pinot, is about Pinot Noir. And you know, Pinot Noir is, uh, I told you, about the, one of the fundamental, one of the pillars of the house, Boulanger. Uh, and we, ha we had before this wine only one Blanc de Noir. Blanc de Noir means 100% Pinot Noir. It was Vieving Francaise. Vieving Francaise, it's two tiny plots. Um, so very, very small production. Uh, it's very rare. And it's pre Philoxera vineyard. So meaning the, the, the vines are en full and uncrafted vines. So the Philoxera is not in this plot. And we still run these vineyards like it was done before the Philoxera came into, into Champagne, into France. So there is a, a strong patrimony in this uh, Vieving Francaise. And um, of course, because it's extremely small, we make only five to 10 barrels every year. So small production. So the price can be a little bit uh, higher and it's, it's kind of difficult to, to get access to it because of the, of the small volumes. So, you know, it was kind of a nonsense to be um, uh, one of the champions of Pinot Noir, but having only one wine uh, made 100% of Pinot Noir, uh, one champagne at least. And um, another element that uh, helped us to for this wine was um, the consumer awareness. Um, you know, the, the, the people, the, the, our, the champagne consumers are getting more and more um, uh, knowledgeable about champagne. Now it's not just about uh, which, which house or which brand you like. No, it's about which uh, vintage. It's about which producer. It's about which plots. It's about, okay, what is a blend, et cetera, et cetera. So the questions and the interest for champagne is getting way higher than it was 10 years ago. And we felt it was the perfect timing for us to come with a wine a little bit more uh, technical. Um, and this is the idea of this uh, PM, uh, which is having a while more, more, more approachable in terms of you know, volume and price positioning, but at the same time, still um, extremely focused uh, and, and detail about, uh, about Pinot Noir. So it is 100% Pinot Noir, so it's a Blanc de Noir. And uh, the way the team um, uh, played with it, you know, the, the, when, once we, we decided to, to go with the PN, uh, our, our winemaker, Gilles Descotes, he, he has a lot of a big sense of humor and is very humble. Uh, so he went to his team and said, guys, I have a contest for you to do. And I'm going to be part of the contest. So that, and there are two rules for the contest. First rule, it must be a blend, a non-vintage blend. And second rule, it must be 100% uh, Pinot Noir. So that's how already the team, the technical, the analogical team started to play with that. So there were five of them. And they did each of them uh, a blend, you know, it was really contest and the blind tasting, then blind tasting. And at the end, fortunately, the one that won was Gilles Descotes, so the, the winemaker. So he was the one winning with his blend. And what is interesting, it's uh, his blend really pushed all the cursor of the DNA of Champagne Boulanger at a level where we, we, we never went before. I, I told you about the, the barrel fermentation, which is a key element of Champagne Boulanger. You have some in special cuvee, and on our grand année, it's 100% barrel fermented. 
So here on this one, we are right in the middle. 50% of this wine is barrel fermented. You have to imagine that in Champagne, the barrel fermentation is completely forgotten. In the 50s, 60s, there was a process completely lost and only two houses kept it in all their wines. It's Krug and Bollinger. For us, we're seeking the, the texture and the complexity of the wines uh, with the barrel fermentation. So here we pushed uh, the barrel fermentation up to 50%. And also another element, I told you about the, the reserve wine, uh, you know, that are quite intensive on, the, on Champagne Boulanger. So here again, uh, Gilles Descotes pushed quite hard on the, on the reserve wine with a lot of uh, wines of those river wines coming from the Magnums. Magnums in reserve wines, I mean, uh, reserve wine in Magnums, really nobody's doing this in Champagne. It's uh, something very unique. And uh, when you taste those reserve wines that are, can be like 10 years old, it's, we call them the, the aromatic bombs because they are so intense. It's like tasting an old wine and you understand what they bring to the, to the blend. So that's how that was his recipe. A uh, lot of barrel fermentation, a lot of uh, reserve wine coming from the, from the magnums. And then he played also with some cru. And it's interesting, the first vintage was 2015. This is uh, the, the first release. So the base wine is 2015, which is a dominant vintage. It was a hot year. It was a draft in Champagne. And you know, when it's hot, the vine can suffer. You have uh, less acidity. And in Champagne, we love acidity. And Gilles Descotes went specifically for Grand Cru on the northern slope of, uh, of uh, Montagne de Reims. It's called Verzenay. And this is not a, a cru you will typically find on a, on a single vineyard uh, because it's, it's usually very austere. So it's quite remarkable that on, the, on this very dry and solar year, Gilles Descotes went to seek the freshness and acidity of, uh, of Verzenay. So the combination you know, of that makes, uh, makes the best blend uh, of this contest. And that's how, what, we, what we've been uh, released uh, this year. And on the label, it's, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's, it's actually a very James Bond code. It's PN, VZ, and 15. So if you come, and uh, you're all welcome to come to Champagne Boulanger, if you come to our caves, uh, you know, you go down the, down the, the caves, and you will see uh, rows and rows of, uh, of bottles, and they all have uh, chalkboards uh, to identify them. And on those chalkboards, there are a few uh, characters. So PN, for instance, the, the code for the, for the cultivar. There are another, uh, which is a, the, a code for the cru, where it's coming from, and there is the vintage. So on the label, we decided to go back to this chalkboard and to put them the same code on the, on the, on the, on the label of, uh, of PN. So PN, VZ15, it means PN for Pinot Noir, 100% Pinot Noir. VZ for Verzenay, dominant uh, cru is Verzenay. And 15, this is the base wine, so dominant uh, vintage, which is uh, 2015. So there is a, a, fun, uh, a fun code also uh, here. On the... So that's the story of, uh, of PN. We're extremely excited with this wine. Very, very cool. And what will people expect to be tasting when they taste this champagne? Yeah, um, so it, I've been tasting it since uh, June, uh, you know, on more on a regular basis. And the first thing, and that's comment that uh, came also, you know, uh, with people that we've been tasted with, people are extremely surprised with the, the fruit. There is a lot of fruit on this wine. 15, it's not, uh, it's not uh, a young uh, champagne. Huh? It's already uh, uh, close to six years old. And uh, people are really surprised with, uh, with the juiciness, the freshness of the fruit. It's, um, how do you call it, the, the, the pit fruit, you know, the apricot, uh, peach. It's very, uh, very much on this, uh, on this area. Uh, so that would be the first element. And then you have some uh, spices also. And the spices are related or remind us of the, of the reserve wines coming from the Magnum. This is not, and usually, you know, the, the winemaker usually likes to compare himself with the chef doing the food and the reserve wines coming from the Magnums. It's like spices on the dish. And you get this spiciness also on the nose and on the palate. Uh, and then of course the texture, which is really the signature of the house, the texture coming from the barrel fermentation is really uh, delicate. And, uh, and creamy, uh, back to the creamy bubbles. And also what is quite interesting is the finish. You know, the finish of the wine is very important because this is what, what is going to, to last 
in your uh, in your mouth. And he, here we have the uh, finish and the minerality uh, with a beautiful salinity. So it's mineral and salinity, and that's uh, thanks to Verzenay. So we back, you know, to uh, to the profile of the cru of the dominant cru on this wine, uh, which is very mineral and uh, and uh, high, bring a, a nice salinity, which makes the wine really alive. And uh, it makes you want uh, more to drink more of this wine. Yeah, I can attest to that. To expect. Yeah, yeah you, you agree? I agree, hundred <laughs> percent. So, um, what you mentioned food with this before? What would you pair this with, especially over the holidays? Considering, uh, you know, hopefully people will be gathering if they can with their families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can, you know, we 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 worked with some chefs to make a. Uh, the perfect recipe is matching with this wine. And uh, they came out with um, two uh, different recipes. And I think what is interesting is the texture of these uh, recipes. You know, food is, is all about texture. And one is about uh, tartlet with tomatoes. And you have the, the acidity and the, and, the, and the crust of the, of the tartlet and the acidity of the tomatoes that goes very well with, uh, with the wine. So as a starter, you know, you can have this on the aperitif. And uh, if, you, if you want to go with, because champagne can go all over the meal. It's not just for aperitif for celebration. Uh, you can go all, all over the meal. You can go with some nice, uh, more creamy food, like a, a nice risotto, uh, you know, with lentils. Uh, we have lentils specifically coming from champagne. So the chef is from champagne and he, he, he made a beautiful risotto with those lentils. But, you know, this kind of, uh, of food, which is going to match pretty well with the creaminess uh, of the wine that can go uh, quite well. And also, uh, as with most of the wines with Boulanger, one of the top pairing, at, at least one of my favorites, I should not say top pairing, but one of my favorites is, um, is to go with a, with, a, with a cheese, you know, with a hard cheese, like an old Comté. It's always a big win. And uh, when you had a, a tough day, you know, at work or, uh, or at home, if you want to chill and to be very uh, relaxed, you open a nice bottle of champagne, you cut a nice piece of Comté, and this is the best time of the day for sure. <laughs> <laughs> How many times a week do you do this? Uh, seven. <laughs> As you should. <laughs> so why is this champagne a must for champagne enthusiasts, for anybody who really loves champagne? But it is a must because uh, of, uh, of what it represents because it's a, it's a signature of, uh, of Champagne Boulanger. And also, I believe it's something which is very innovative. You don't really have this kind of, uh, because it's going to be a series of wine. It's not going to be just one. It's not going to be just PNVZ15. It's not a one-off. It's going to be a series of wine. It will come with a PN16, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, it's, uh, it's very innovative in, uh, in its approach because it's, uh, it's uh, non-vintage. But every year is going to to look for uh, the, the the taste of uh, Pinot Noir coming from different parts of our vineyards. So you know, in our vineyards, uh, we have many many different locations of Pinot Noir, and we want to explore the taste of Pinot Noir depending on the grapes, on on the on the vintage, and on the on the cru. So it's interesting. Even you know, uh, of course, you can have it and drink it uh, tonight. Uh, but it can be also interesting to start uh, keep some one or two bottles and uh, see with the different editions uh, how they compare themselves because it's going to be all 100% Pinot Noir but with completely different taste. And you know, I told you that Boulanger, we are really focusing on the taste of Pinot Noir, taste of our wines. So here, this is really a, a carte blanche for the, for the winemaking team to play with, uh, with, uh, with our terroir and, uh, and the grape Pinot Noir. So to me, that's why it's, uh, it's quite interesting to have this, uh, if you are a wine aficionado, uh, to have this in your cellar for sure. Well, something you said before, I have to ask. Um, so people, you said that uh, most people celebrate with champagne and it's not something that, you know, you could have it with any part of your meal. Why is it misconstrued that this is just something that you would have before? your meal and how uh, how as a champagne maker do you combat that yeah i think there are a few reasons of uh, of why first of all if you go back to the history of champagne champagne was a sweet wine it was a dessert wine it was very very sweet um you know bonager we are seven grams per per liter 
and I believe uh, we were up to uh, way, way higher than 20, 30 uh, grams per liter. Even it was almost a, a, a quarter of the bottle was just about sugar. Uh, I'm talking uh, 18th, uh, 19th century. So that was a dessert wine. And to me, the, 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 one of the beautiful part of Champagne was the ability of the appellation to bring um, Champagne from dessert to a festive approach, more festive approach. But some houses, and, and that's a clear success, and this is probably why now, uh, when you think of celebration, you pop a cork, or because of, the, of this success in terms of uh, Champagne must be uh, for celebration. And also, you know, when uh, you have the noise, you have the bubble, so it's different than just a red wine. So it's more, uh, it's more for, made for celebration. But then you also have some houses that have been uh, focusing on, uh, on quality, on texture, on taste, and they are foodie people. I mean, we, we love to, 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 to go out to have, uh, so lockdown is terrible those days because we cannot do that, but uh, just to, to, to cook. And, and for us, it's part of our DNA to, uh, to make uh, champagne to go with food. So for, for us, the, the best way to, to, I don't know if it's a fight, but to, to communicate about the ability of champagne going through all the meal is just to make people try and experience. And um, sometimes we, we try with some bold uh, pairing and uh, they match pretty well. You know, the, the, the f some people which are not used to doing champagne and cheese, they can be a little bit shocked, you know, when you say that this is one of my favorite pairing or one of the favorite pairing uh, in our team. And, but my best uh, advice would be to try it, you know, to get a good cheese, a good old cheese uh, like Comté and pair it with, with, a, with a nice bottle of Boulanger, and you will see it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, pairing. Another explanation may be also because, you know, the, the sommelier, they have a, a big list of, of wines on their list, and if they, if they bring champagne uh, to the entire uh, piece of the, of the meal, this is not going to, to work because they will only uh, promote champagne. So they also have to make uh, choices, and some choices, you know, then they decide that champagne goes uh, aperitif and uh, and um, and starter, which is also something we well we we it's not a fight, but we we try to 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 go against because champagne with a with a beautiful fish, beautiful piece of meat can be something extraordinary. Wonderful. Well, is there anything else that you want to share before I turn this over to our audience? But first of all, I want to, to thank you for, uh, for, for being here. And uh, I, want to, I just want to highlight that uh, our team is really uh, committed to, uh, to, to, to produce the best out of, uh, of our grapes. We have our, our, our feet in, in the vineyards every day. And uh, you know, if we are extremely happy to get up every morning to go work at Boulanger, it's because we, we love what we do and we hope there is a little bit of this love uh, in, uh, in the bottle. And uh, I guess uh, my, um, once this COVID situation will be over, I will be uh, extremely happy you know, to, to have you, uh, to have some of you coming at the winery. And uh, we, we love to, to have people. And to, to me, the best experience is to come to the winery and to discover what is Champagne Boulanger. Uh, yeah. So that's definitely uh, an invitation I'm doing tonight. Even if Boulanger is not open to public. So. You have to contact, uh, you have to know someone within Boulanger to come. And, uh, I hope everybody uh, watching heard that. <laughs> you have an open invitation right now from Cyril. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions for Cyril? Uh, anybody watching? And if not, I have one um, that we were actually speaking about before. Um, which is, you gave me the answer, but perhaps you could get, give everybody watching the answer about um, whether or not you would do a special, uh, you know, special cuvee or a special 007 with Sean Connery um, on the box or on the bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we, this is not a, a plan as of now, and uh, we are very careful to, to remain Boulanger, 
and uh, we, we we don't want to be too opportunistic on you know every opportunity that comes to, on our way and uh, first we we make great wines and then we communicate with our partner uh, e, with james bond and uh, i think that would be inappropriate uh, for champagne boulanger to to play uh, i mean to 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 do this kind of uh, of promotion makes sense and we have um, Alyssa, she says, Cyril, what is your advice to someone that doesn't know anything about champagne that wants to buy a bottle for the holidays? But first, uh, you should go for a, a nice bottle of Champagne Boulanger. Uh, if you want, um, depending on, uh, you, you have to think of what you want to do with, um, with, with the bottle of Champagne. If you want to share with um, with a friend and family, uh, if you want to have it with food or not, if you want to, to, to make uh, a little bit of fun, for instance, having the, the champagne during the dinner, like uh, to, with a with a main course, you know that's different. Uh, that's something that can really help you. Uh, but uh, uh, we we've been talking with three champagnes: special cuvee, rosé, and the PN. And uh, picking one of those three, I think, would be uh, would be a fair choice uh, if you want to to have fun with the champagne uh, over the holidays. Absolutely. Christopher wants to know, are there any other brands you plan on partnering with? So we've been always quite um, uh, very discreet. Uh, Champagne Boulanger, is, uh, this is how we, we've been described, uh, uh, very discreet. So partnership, partnering with, um, with, uh, with brands is not so much what we, what we are doing. So as of now, this is really our, our, um, our top partnership. And this is the one we are, we are focusing on here. Yeah. Um, another question is 007, uh, Bonger and Aston Martin, three brands that have evolved into the 21st century seamlessly. Each one has its legacy and they're intertwined. How does it feel to carry on such tradition? It feels very good, <laughs> but it also, you know, it's, we, we are, um, we are very uh, conscious of the privilege, uh, we have. And you know there is no money involved in this partnership with uh, with Bollinger and uh, and Bond, so we are extremely privileged to be uh, to be part of this uh, family uh, uh, and this partnership going with uh, with uh, with uh, with the broccoli family. So that's uh, to me that, that would be the world uh, I would say. Uh, this is I think this is quite unique in the history of the cinema to have a 40 years old uh, partnership with no money involved, based on the, on a handshake, and still going on. So it's a lot of respect with the two families, I would say. It's so rare in today's climate. Unbelievable that that still exists today. But um, you have a lot of questions here. So what would um, what would you say is your favorite release and why? Favorite release, what do you mean? In terms of vintage? Favorite champagne, yep. But I will, I will, stay, uh, I will stay on Boulanger. Uh, yes. <laughs> My favorite um, release, so last year we, we released uh, quite a, an outstanding wine. It was La Grande Année 2008. So La Grande Année is our um, prestige cuvee. And uh, 2008, it's uh, one of the top, uh, top vintage, you know, uh, over the last uh, 10 years. It's 2002 and 2008 are the last uh, really top, top wines. And uh, we got uh, 100 uh, points on this wine, which is um, with a French magazine, which is something extremely rare to, to get. So there was obviously uh, a, a lot of, uh, of proudness from the team to, to be able to release such a, such a vintage. If I want to speak more personally, um, I had the, the luck to taste uh, older vintages of, uh, of Champagne Boulanger, including um, the, 19, the 1929, uh, which was quite outstanding also. The, the wine was, uh, it was a, a very brief moment because when you taste such an old wine, you know, it's not going to last uh, as a younger wine. But uh, for like uh, 15, 20 minutes, it was something extraordinary. Just opening such a, such a bottle, it's already uh, a lot of emotion. And then when you, when you put it in the glass and you see that the, the wine is still alive, it's, uh, it was really extraordinary, very extraordinary. Incredible. And... Would you consider partnering with a well-known charity or a nonprofit on a global scale? Um, this, I mean, everything is to be discussed, of course. Uh, we, we, we are not uh, close to, to partnership, 
It, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we do some, um, so, some uh, partnerships with uh, charity associations. Um, one, of our, um, one of our criteria is to, to work locally. We are extremely involved uh, locally. Uh, and this is uh, so far what we've been focusing most. Uh, but I mean, this being said, uh, everything can be discussed. And what would the tasting experience be like for anybody visiting the caves? It would be extraordinary. <laughs> Specifically. <laughs> oh, well, first of all, we, we don't have a, a set visit. So first we, we start by, you know, getting to know you and then we adjust the, the visit uh, depending on who we have in front of us. And again, remember the, the house is not open to the public. We currently, we, we only do visits to, to, to professionals um, and to some, some people recommended by, uh, by professionals. So um, it's, a, it's a very dedicated and intense uh, visit. It's, it lasts between one to two hours, depending on the questions. So we like to take our time. And then, uh, you know, you're going to taste a few wines. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it's very, uh, very personalized. This is what I want to say. Um, this person wants to know, what is the best bottle of Boulanger to share with family during the winter holidays? So this is, we're going back to a similar question we had earlier. Actually, there is no really um, a season to taste Champagne Boulanger. You can taste it all over the year. And again, we are not um, following trends. You know, it's been 200 years old that the house is on. And I think uh, one, of our, um, one of our assets is that we are focusing to excellence and not to trend. And you know, when you, to me, the, the, def the best definition of excellence is to be better year after year. So your goal is to be better to the prior year. So you're not focusing to what is on your right, what is on your, on your left. You're really focusing to be the best uh, year after year. So when you do that, you're not really making a wine, especially with Champagne Boulanger, where time is very important. And you know, uh, our, the minimum age we're going to, to, to keep a wine on our caves is, is going to be three to four years. Uh, and that's going to be special cuvee. It's going to be seven years for La Grande Année. It's going to be 15 years for Hardy. So when you do such a long time on the lease on aging, you cannot really focus on seasonality. It's not like a, a Rosé de Provence or these kind of wines. So every single wine in the Boulanger range can be enjoyed anytime. Um, that was the point with the Rosé what uh, we discussed earlier. So uh, in, in winter, you know, uh, the most important is to be, uh, to have a good meal, to be with some pe people you like, you love, and just to have fun. That would be my best recommendation if you want to open a bottle of Boulanger. What would be the best time to come and visit um, Champagne during the year? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, Champagne can be a kind of a austere uh, area. It's a lot of rain in winter. It can be extremely cold. Um, so I would suggest to come more uh, after April when the vine starts to, you know, to have leaves on. Uh, and then um, forget about August because August, you know, this is France and uh, summer holidays are extremely important. So everything will be closed. So it's better to come then September when it's harvest or end of August with the harvest. And then you can come until easily until October. So the best time would probably be May, June, July, and then, uh, and then October, September, October. And I think we've got time for one more question, which um, will be, I guess, uh, how have you pivoted during, um, during the COVID time? How we've been? How you've pivoted? How um, how difficult has it been for you to work within this the pandemic? It it has been um, quite difficult. Uh, we we've been uh, on the lockdown for a few weeks, you know, uh, in March, and now again. But I have to say, uh, our team is doing an incredible job because, of course, the production team they have to adjust. The, the, the sales team, the, the administrative team is different because we are more, we are we can be um, working from home. But when you are uh, when you have to go to the cave to the to the cellar, uh, currently we have a, a, a we have around four thousand barrels which are full of premium and grand cru fermenting. So we must take them all the time. So if you have nobody coming to the to 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 the cellar, it, it's a catastrophe. So the team has been extremely good uh, because they've adjusted themselves pretty fast. 
and uh, having a um, new process in terms of sanitary barriers, etc. And we've been able to, um, to, to keep the, the, the flow of, uh, of blending, of bottling, of shipping, uh, almost uh, normal despite the, the COVID situation. So difficult, but uh, thanks to the effort of the entire team, we've been uh, handling the situation pretty well. Fantastic. That's good to hear. Yeah. Well, Cyril, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much to Champagne Boulanger. Um, we so appreciate this. Um, and thank you to our presenter, uh, Aston Martin Residences. And